Today's lecture is about bioindicator species. Sometimes it's shortened to the name indicator species. The name is used, it's interchangeable. Sometimes we use bioindicator or just shorten it to indicator species. The term might be familiar to you because we covered this briefly in a lecture, in lecture six actually, on the 16th of October, when we did a lecture on species concepts and conservation. We looked at keystone species and flagship species and umbrella species. We also looked briefly at indicator species. You may want to go back and look at that later. The reason we're looking at indicator species is that for many, many years, ecological communities, habitats and environments have been measured to assess the condition what condition they are in and if they're deteriorating or improving. And it's an important job that um, scientists, environmental scientists are involved in. When we use a species to monitor an environment, rather than going out and gathering, it mightn't be practical to gather water samples all the time, or maybe soil samples, or monitor the condition of an area. We can use species as a bioindicator of the quality and condition of that habitat, environment, or ecological site. And they've been used for a long time uh, for that purpose. It's particularly good if you're going to an area that you know hasn't been monitored or maybe distant, uh, a, a distant place that's hard to access, like mountains, for example bioindicator species are really good to tell you when you arrive at a habitat if you monitor for some time the species there you can tell the quality of the environment so to give you a definition a definition of a bioindicator species is a species is a bioindicator species is an organism used to monitor the health of an ecosystem that's probably the simplest definition a bioindicator species or an indicator species is an organism used to monitor the health of an ecosystem. One of the ones you might be familiar with here is the kingfisher, used to monitor water quality because of the small fish it feeds on, and those fish require um, high oxygenated, good quality water. So if the water is bad, it affects the fish. If there's eutrophication, too many pollutants or nutrients going into the system, the kingfisher won't be there or they will decline. So they can indicate the water quality. Can you think of any other indicator species that you're familiar with? Just think about it for a minute. Some of them are aquatic and some of them are terrestrial. So to look at some examples of bioindicators and what they're used for. Bioindicator species are used to understand the health of an environment. So that's pretty obvious. They can tell us the health of an environment. Often the more species, the diversity of species you have in a habitat or an ecosystem, the better the health of that environment or ecosystem or habitat. They can be used to detect changes in these environments. And these um, particularly natural envir environments, but they're also be being beginning to use, it's very new in even urban or non-natural environments. But particularly in natural environments, they can detect changes. So if species disappear from a site or even return to a site, they can detect, they can be used to detect the changes in how that site or habitat, woodland, stream, wetland area can change. Also, they can be used to monitor for pollutants and the effects of the pollutions, pollutants in the ecosystem. So they can look they can indicate the presence of a pollution and the effects of a pollution. And this has been uh, well documented in science 
Peregrine falcons are one of the classic examples. Peregrine falcons uh, were in big decline because of uh, pesticides, DDT, being used on as a as a uh, an insect repellent. DDT was used on crops that fed up through the food chain into the bird. When the bird laid the egg, the shell of the egg was very fragile, and birds began to decline peregrine falcons because they were breaking their own eggs. It took a long time to figure out that they were indicating the level of toxin that was in the of a pollutant that was in the environment. They can also indicate the progress of environmental cleanups or remedial measures. So if a site is cleaned up or restored or remedial measures are put in, they can be used to indicate that. There's a very topical example at the moment with the COVID-19 uh, lockdown in parts of Italy and even in Venice. There's a lot of reports of, spe of species returning to, to the canals and the waterways because of the, the uh, lack of people and lack of stuff going into the, into the water. So they can indi indicate a clean-up or remedial measures. One of the remedial measures might be flood relief systems in towns. We looked at that in Clonmel. So if you put in a remedial measure and species don't return, is it because there was hard infrastructure or concrete put in? Or was there room left for biodiversity? So they can tell you if something is being cleaned up or did um, remedial measures work. So there are a number of other, three more um, examples we're going to look at here. They can also measure the progress in biodiversity conservation policy. Now, this is really important because a lot of us study biodiversity and sustainability. And one of the key ways of measuring is our biodiversity policy working, our sustainability policies working, is to measure biodiversity and look at species. We can use indicator species for that. Access... They can, sorry, they can assess impacts and threats on biodiversity. So again, an indicator species can tell you if something is having an impact or threatening biodiversity. For example, it could be an invasive species might have an impact or be a threat to biodiversity. It could be using some kind of fertilizer. It could be using... Um, what else? It could be a management policy even, a way of managing hedgerows or managing the countryside. It could be how trees are felled in a large, or maybe native or even non-native forests, whether they're clear felled or, or trees are taken out selectively. So it can assess the impacts and the threats on biodiversity from different measures, usually anthropogenic man-made measures. And like I said with the measurement, they can evaluate sustainability measures and goals. So with, um, the, with sustainability, one of the difficulties with sustainability and sustainability goals is measuring them. How do you know you've achieved them? And one of the good ways is through biodiversity or environmental quality or habitat quality and water quality. And bioindicator species can be used to evaluate that. Sorry. I want to look lastly at birds specifically as bioindicators. And you might remember we looked at here the bearded vulture in another lecture. So birds are used as indicator species pretty often. And I want to focus specifically on them now for the last of this few minutes of this lecture. Birds make very good bioindicator or indicator species. And I want to go through a number of reasons here why they, they make that. One is they're very sensitive to environmental contaminants. So birds forage, they eat insects, they eat, some of them scavenge. 
and they're very sensitive to environmental contaminants, any contaminants in the environment they're susceptible to it. I, me I mentioned um, peregrine falcons earlier, but you may remember from looking at the bearded vulture that they were very sensitive as well to contaminants in their environment, particularly poisons. A lot of birds have already been monitored and there's many, many surveys have been done and many people have been out monitoring like you have on wetlands. So we know what's there. Lots of people monitor them. It's easy to identify them. It's easy to survey them. So that's why they make really good bioindicators. We have long-term data sets. So when people, are, <laughs> excuse me, when people are monitoring birds, They've been doing it for a long, long time. So we have long data sets. So we have trends built up and we know how they fluctuate. We know how they migrate. We know roughly what the population size should be. So in that regard, we can spot any changes in bird populations pretty quickly. Birds also make excellent bar barometers of the health of the whole environment. So they're very good in that in that regard. They occur in many habitats. So some species only occur in some habitats. Birds occur, you can use birds as indicators in almost all habitats. And they reflect changes with other animals and plants as well. So over time, they reflect a lot of changes. So they're excellent because they're sensitive, they're good barometers of it. You can see the hen harrier here, one of the rarest birds of prey in Europe. We have a strong population in Ireland, but it is under threat from forestry and agricultural improvement. And it is sensitive to the health of the environment. It is a, an indicator species. They occur, as I said, in all habitats and reflect changes in other animals and plants. There's a reference there um, from a book. Sorry about that. There's a reference there from a book. It's the key reading, key topics in conservation and biodiversity. Or sorry, key topics in conservation by MacDonald and Service. And I think it's the second chapter in the book by Mace et al. Prioritizing Choices in Conservation has a small bit on indicator species. And this book can be found at the top of the Moodle page. So that's the end of the lecture. If there's anything you don't understand or need me to follow up on, please email me. Next Wednesday, I'll upload another short video. None of them will be more than 15 minutes long. So I hope this worked for you. And again, thanks for those who emailed me last week to say, whether they found this method of delivery good or not. Again, I'd like your feedback on it. Apologies for any coughing or spurting I did throughout. Um, so take care and stay safe.